Um, welcome everyone to the uh, joint seminar or webinar we have today um, hosted by SIPSI Building Simulation Group and um, IBIPSA England. It's uh, obviously a very, very hot topic, uh, estimating airborne infection through simulation and analysis. We have a great program lined up for you, a great series of speakers. Um, uh, I will start with a welcome, followed by um, a whole series of speakers, uh, and I will uh, finish that off with uh, my take on building simulation and airborne infection, followed by the panel uh, session. We're looking to keep it to uh, 90 minutes. Uh, before I make a start, I'd like to uh, quickly thank all the uh, people that helped um, support the setup and marketing uh, for my BIPSA England, uh, Rushi Rakaya and um, uh, Renjif from Sibsi BSG, uh, Vasiliki and Alex, and uh, from uh, Sibsi um, uh, Jade Solar. Um, the recording, uh, sorry, the meeting is being recorded and um, there will be, um, everyone will be muted and um, if anyone could switch their video off, that would be uh, appreciated. And I'd now like to uh, welcome the first speaker, Malcolm Cook. He's Associate Dean for Research and Professor of uh, Building Performance Analysis in the Building Energy Research Group in Loughborough University. Thank you very much, uh, Darren, and uh, thank you, Sibsi, for the opportunity to talk about this project. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen, which hopefully I have now done. Um, so hopefully you should all be able to see my my first slide. Um, is that right, Darren? Can you can you acknowledge you can see it? Yeah, thank you. OK, so uh, Darren's given me five minutes to give an overview of a really exciting project, so I'm going to have to go rather quickly. Uh, the project has only just kicked off, so uh, um, it, it will be more of an overview of the um, intentions of the project as opposed to any, any, um, any key results at this stage. Um, AirBODS, which stands for Airborne Infection Reduction through Building Operation and Design for SARS-CoV-2, is, is a very big project, um, received funding from uh, EPSRC and, and the DCMS, for which we're very grateful. And I, I'd like to acknowledge um, several key collaborators um, who are listed along the bottom of this slide here. It's a very big project. Um, with a, a multifaceted approach to the um, to the problem. Um, so the project aim then is to deliver guidance on the ventilation operation of, of non-domestic buildings and move into the um, future design of, of non-domestic buildings and to quantify the risk of and thereby um, aspire to reduce the risk of transmission of of SARS-CoV-2. Um, we're using three, three key methods to achieve that aim. So this, this is through experimental, um, experimental work, computer simulation work and, and field work, which will then lead into the design guidance, which we hope to um, disseminate through collaboration with, with SIBSI. Um, so I'll just run through each of the work packages uh, and I will read this because you can't read and listen at the same time I've learned. So the first work package then, this is the experimental work which is being led by Abigail Hathaway at Sheffield and Lena Sirik at UCL, which, whereby we're going to use environmental uh, uh, chambers to provide experimental data on the transport and distribution of aerosols. So we're going to look at very tightly tightly controlled um, environments where we're tracking exhaled particles from um, from a mannequin into the into the ventilated space and to and, and to track their their movement throughout that throughout that chamber and that's going to help to provide um, validation data for our experimental our experimental models 
Um, so moving on to work package two then. So this is where the modeling uh, uh, comes into play. So this is split into three subtasks. So the first one led by Sean Fitzgerald at Cambridge and um, Thorsten Stosa from UCL. So this is where we're using analytical methods, developing analytical methods to, to better understand the physical processes involved in, in aerosol transport. So primarily the transport as the, as the particles leave, um, leave the mouth and enter into the, into the occupied space. And in particular, what we're, what we're interested in here is to, is to uh, consider the correlation um, between uh, the evaporation of these aerosols and the environmental temperature and, and relative humidity. Um, we'll be undertaking some detailed CFD modelling led by myself and Leora Malkiefstein from UCL. Um, and the work here will be to compare, to, to first of all, model the, the um, experimental setup but then move on to some of the field study scenarios and to look at um, uh, the best way to, to model those scenarios, whether it be unsteady RANS models or large eddy simulation models um, to, to, um, to better understand the air movement around these spaces and the, and the fresh air distribution. And this will help us to inform something called um, a relative exposure index, which I will leave Ben Jones to talk about um, in, the, in the next presentation. So the intention is that this work, the CFD modeling work will, will also underpin design and operation guidance for practicing engineers by providing them with um, guidance on how to use CFD modeling for modeling these sorts of these sorts of situations. As I said, um, the first two tasks of this work package will feed into work that Ben Jones and Chris Eden are undertaking, and I'll let Ben uh, talk a little bit about that in the next in the next presentation. Um, so moving on to the the field studies, then um, I'm sure many of you have seen in the media over recent days um, the um, the work that the events research program has been has been doing in Liverpool. Um, so there's some some images here as some of the spaces that we've been that we've been helping to model uh, to 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 uh, monitor. Sorry. Um, and what we're doing here is to measure temperature, relative humidity and CO2 in these in these spaces um, as a means of understanding how the ventilation systems are are behaving and um, how how um, how well the um, how well the exhaled breath is being is being removed from those from those spaces and how well the incoming fresh air is distributed around the um, around the occupants. So then, my final slide. Um, all of this activity. This is an 18-month project. Will then feed into um, uh, back to the aim. So Zulfikar Adamu, Darren, and myself um, are leading on the design guidance and dissemination in collaboration with with Sibsi, where we'll be using the. Um, the lessons we learn from these work packages to inform practical guidance for um, for practicing engineers, both on the design and the operation of of, um, of ventilation systems, but also to provide guidance on how to use um, simulation tools for for these sorts of applications. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Uh, I should add that um, these slides and the recording will be available on the Building Simulation Group uh, past presentations area. And there's a link to that in my talk um, later, if you wish, and possibly linked to on the IBIPSA um, England side as well. And if you've got any questions, please use the chat box. We're going to be picking up uh, those questions in the um, in the Q&A session. Um, afterwards and if you're directing a question to a particular person please put their name first. So I would now like to introduce the uh, second speaker um, 
Ben, uh, the focus of his work is on uh, measurement and modelling approaches to the indoor environment that can inform policies to create low carbon, healthy building stocks. He's particularly interested in the energy efficient ventilation of buildings and its relationship with indoor air quality and occupant health. Ben. Thanks very much. I hope you can hear and see me OK. Aaron, if you could just confirm. Yes, thanks. Perfect, great. So um, I'll get underway. So with a quick nod to collaborators, this work's already been published in Building Environments, so you can uh, go and find it there. There are a whole list of links at the end if you want to explore much of what I talk about in much greater detail. Otherwise, you're, you're welcome to co contact me directly. Uh, particular thanks goes to my colleague Chris Hidden, who's just joined me here at Nottingham. So this work solely considers uh, long range transmission and it's airborne and it's via inhalation. It's not via touch. So if you can see my pointer here, it's purely, purely this mechanism uh, here. So we're considered, we're interested in um, in the transmission via aerosols, whereas uh, a quick definition of what an aerosol is, it's the suspension system of solid or liquid particles in a gas. And we're, we're particularly interested in those with an evaporative diameter of uh, less than 10 micrometers. So these here, uh, why? Because they remain airborne for several hours, buoyed by local cur currents. And uh, when they're ejected by somebody who is who has uh, COVID-19, they contain um, or may contain uh, copies of ribonucleic acid of the SARS-CoV-2 genome, which have been found in, in sputum. So a proportion of RNA copies will be viable virions capable of infecting a an individual. Um, so you can see then there's, there's the coronavirus itself. But what we do not know, there's quite a lot we don't know actually, and so we have to make a lot of assumptions or, or try and remove what we don't know from our modeling. Uh, what proportion of RNA copies are viable virions? What the dose response relationship is? So how many copies of the virus do we need before we become infected? Um, so the minimum dose required for an infection, which is known as a quantum, which forms the basis of the Wells-Riley method, which has suddenly gained a lot of prominence recently, and it's used for determining infection probability. So uh, there's a oh, OK, so we started off by defining a, a single zone space using good old mass balance. What goes in equals what goes out and the mechanisms for um, gaining or losing um, aerosols containing the virus in an indoor environment. So the gains might be from from a from a person. Well, they'll be solely from a person. Entry may also come, I suppose, via ventilation infiltration. It may be present in the space. And our losses then may come from these five mechanisms given here, dilution via ventilation, deposition on surfaces, uh, much like, uh, well, like all particles do, biological decay, so they'll ha they have a half-life and will decay over time. You may also have a device which uh, denatures them using UVC light. They'll be absorbed, of course, by the respiratory tracts of everybody present in the room, and you might have some system which filters them. Now, for the purposes of this work, we uh, only ex uh, define gains as coming from uh, an infected person. For all the results you're about to see now, we assumed one infected person in the space, although, of course, the most likely number of infected people in a space is none. The next most likely number is one, although as you increase the size of the space and the number of people in it, the probability of it rising above one does increase. So uh, we have a number of loss mechanisms and they can also all be given as a rate. And uh, when you run the model through, what you find is all those rates can be added up to produce what is known as an equivalent air change rate. And I'll talk about this value that's phi. You can see that uh, all the um, uh, single loss mechanisms add up um, and to give us this phi value. Now we don't uh, consider filtration in this study at the moment. Now, if you integrate through and um, we have a step response function, which uh, assumes the virus is emitted by, an emit by a person over a period of time in some space, 
we end up with the, we can calculate the total number of RNA copies inhaled. Uh, we don't go any further than that because uh, we don't know the proportion, of course, that are viable virions. So we can reduce this down really to six parameters. There are a lot of assumptions or a lot of calculations that go into producing these six uh, parameters in some circumstances, but, but it helps us to think about the space. So we've got to ratio the number of aerosol particles that are absorbed by the respiratory tract to the number that actually pass through it in a breath. So those you breathe in may not all stick. And that's that's indicated by K, and that's that's unitless because it's a it's a fraction. And then we have the volume flow rate through the respiratory tract, so that's your breath rate um, expressed as a volume per second. Um, so that's affected by your metabolic rate. And then we have the the emission rate of RNA copies. That's also affected by your metabolic rate. It's also affect, um, affected by the other things. It depends how how infectious you are too. So we have to make some assumptions about that. Then we have the exposure period. So you can see that the number of RNA copies you inhale is linearly related to the exposure period. And then on the uh, denominator numerator, on the bottom there, we have uh, the, the space volume, which is a major source of uh, confounding, actually, because it's very easy to, to get dimensions of a space. But of course, um, once you part, start putting things in a space or if you have cupboards with closed doors, the uh, space in which the virus can mix in may not be the same as the room volume, but for the purpose of this study, we consider them to be one and the same. And then we have the dilution rate. And what, what we can see here then is there is a law of diminishing returns between the dilution rate phi and the number of RNA copies you inhale. But bear in mind from a, from a building services point of view, uh, phi, uh, or at least the ventilation component of phi is linear related to, to any heat loss from the space. So I want to apply this equation now to, to a, a school classroom. Why did we choose a school classroom? Because it's pretty well defined actually by a number of guidance documents, BB103, BB101. So they, they give a minimum floor area for a junior school, so we chose that. Most classes have 30 students and two teachers in, so we started there. And then we, we started with a general minimum floor to ceiling height of 2.7 meters, which gave us a volume of around 150 cubic meters. We then um, assumed that uh, the BB101 minimum five litres per second per person was delivered and that the children were in there with their teachers for seven hours continuously. So it's a really bad day. Perhaps it's been raining and they've had no playtime. And then we, we made some assumptions about their breathing time and their talk time. So 75% breathing, 25% talk. And we came up with this plot. So on the left Y axis, you have the, these dashed lines here. If we look at line A, this is the number of RNA copies present in the space over time. So it quickly reaches a steady state after about an hour and then stays there. Now, the line associated with that, the number of RNA copies inhaled is this solid line A here. And you can see that it's approximately linear. Now, we wanted to know what would happen if uh, we just used ventilation in, and assumed none of the other removal mechanisms and actually, uh, you can see that there's quite a significant difference and the other removal mechanisms do matter. So that would be line C. Uh, then we wanted to know what would happen if, say, the infected person left after an hour. And you can see here then that the concentration would die back down to uh, ambient, well, back down to zero because we assume there is no ambient concentration of the of the uh, virus. And uh, then the people remaining in the room, the number of RNA copies they inhale would plateau off. Now, if as that infected person left, somebody else entered the space, uh, then you get line D and uh, their exposure, having not shared the space at all with the infected person, but just had their sort of residual uh, RNA copies left floating around in, in aerosols, their, their exposure is, is significantly less than everybody else in the space. OK, so I mentioned that there are a lot of uncertainties. We then uh, used what's called a, a Monte Carlo approach, which enables you to assess for the uncertainty in each of the input parameters by specifying a probability distribution function for each of the inputs. Now, one way to think about that is uh, if you were to think about the height of a, the adult male in the UK or in any country, you might say the average was about 100. 70 something, 74, I think it is. But but actually, you know that the, the 
distribution of that of height data is quite wide and you could express that with a histogram. Well, we use a range of histograms for each of the inputs. And uh, we run the, the simulation uh, 10,000 times roughly for, for each of the uh, scenarios we looked at. And that then gives us a distribution of outputs. And you can see that here with the, the histogram of RNA copies inhaled. And if we then have a cumulative frequency curve, you have 0% uh, of the data and 100% of the data here. And here you can read off the median, which is around 184 RNA copies inhaled, 183 RNA copies inhaled, or we can take a 95% confidence interval of 77 to 353 inhaled over a seven hour period in this classroom by one person. Okay, so you can see that there's a significant range how to compare this scenario to another one? Well, what we decided was then was to take that median value and divide all the other centiles by it, and then all the other centiles of another scenario by it. So if you have your uh, scenario that you want to compare to on the bottom here, you can compare the number of RNA copies at the top. And uh, then if your, your relative exposure index, which is the ratio of the two, if it's greater than one, then your second space possibly poses a, a higher exposure risk. Uh, and, and then if your REI is less than one, then it possibly poses a, a lower exposure risk. Whereas if it's equal to one, then, then they have roughly the same risk for each of the spaces. So we then looked at a number of scenarios, and you may have seen this plot if you uh, picked up the SAGE uh, ventilation guidance issued in October of last year. And you can see that our, our reference case is on the left here, school classroom, but interestingly, a, a 20 person office occupied for eight hours a day is uh, pretty much identical to our school classroom. So the Sage Environmental Modeling Group chose to use the office as their reference case rather than the school classroom, whereas the paper went with the classroom. So we have a number of other scenarios. We have a, a visit to a coffee shop for, for, for an hour which is uh, a pretty low risk and, and that assumes that it's well ventilated. This assumes, sorry, excuse me, that it's uh, only ventilated by in, infiltration uh, because not all uh, small retail spaces have uh, adequate ventilation. A one hour shop in a supermarket is very low risk compared to either the office or the school classroom. Uh, notice that each of these lines is, is a log scale. So each of these vertical lines here is an order of magnitude um, uh, less risky as you go down. We then considered a gym, which we found a one hour visit to a gym, which we found to be uh, slightly more risky than uh, both the office and the classroom. We also considered uh, a number of super spreading events reported in the academic literature. We found then that the Skagit choir incident in the States and a, a, an incident in a German meeting room were, were order of magnitude more risky than our our spaces, but we weren't able to reproduce the risk or, or the uh, the indication of the risk in the Guangzhou um, restaurant, and that's because there are probably many many other factors at play that we just were not reported in the literature that we just weren't able to to cope with. So uh, I I got a couple of slides of key findings. Um, the first thing to point out then is, is that, that what we found is, is, is that uncertainty is very high. So we, in order to deal with that, we, we developed the REI, the Relative Exposure Index, which is a measure of the risk of a space relative to the geometry, occupant activities and exposure times to a reference scenario. It's not a measure of uh, probability of infection. And uh, uh, the reasons for that I described in, in the first couple of slides. So the number of RNA copies uh, inhaled during an, a, a time spent in an indoor environment is affected by six parameters. So the emission rate, the RNA copies, the respiratory rate, so the metabolic rate of the person in there, exposure time, the space volume, and the removal rate are key parameters. And we did conduct a sensitivity analysis on the, on the data, and it's most sensitive to the emission rate. It's a very simple model, and that's because the emission rate is the largest number. So, Activities such as exercise and singing increase the emission rate substantially because they change the number of aerosols released. And then we wanted to think about how you provide a space that has an equivalent uh, REI to our classroom. And in order to uh, 
have an equivalent removal rate, you must provide at least 0.21 meters cubed per second per infected person as a minimum rate, irrespective of the number of people present in the space. So, so the minimum uh, uh, ventilation rate there. Using a fixed air change rate is problematic. Uh, it will lead to an REI greater than one, and this is where space volume really starts to matter. Chris Idden and I are writing an article for Sipsy Journal, which we hope will be in the next Sipsy Journal next month, explaining why space volume matters so much. It starts to affect uh, many of the other parameters, so we need to be using uh, volume flow rates and not air change rates in buildings. A per capita flow rate can only be used with the minimum flow rate, so you should always choose the maximum of the two. And finally, uh, using CO2 sensors is, is problematic in some circumstances, particularly if a space is under-occupied or the volume is large, um, but I will leave our next speaker to talk about that. Um, Thank you very much, Ben. That's me done. Um, thanks very much for listening. There's a, I'll, I'm sure the slides will be shared and there are a number of links you can pick up on then if you're interested. Thank you. Yes. And there was a, a previous question about where the slides will be. They'll be on the Builder Simulation Past Presentations um, group area. Um, I'd like to now invite Paul to share his screen. He's a professor of fluid mechanics in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge. He led the Royal Society's ramp task on environmental and aerosol transport of COVID-19. Thank you, Paul. I can see your slides, yeah. Thank you, Darren, that's good to know. Can you see it as a slideshow? Uh, not at the moment, it's uh, if you okay. can now, thanks. Okay. Well, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk about uh, some work we've done recently uh, using carbon dioxide measurements to estimate airborne uh, risk of infection of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this work has mainly been carried out by Caroline Voirot from who's a PhD student at Imperial College, supervised by Henry Burridge, and also has involved Kath Noakes and myself, and I've unashamedly stolen Caroline's slides, um, which are much better than I could make. Uh, so just to say, uh, one of the things that we're concerned about with schools is what roles do schools play in transmission of the virus? And how do you estimate uh, the risk? And one of the things that we were very concerned about because this work uh, took place last summer was uh, what would happen this uh, coming winter. As you know, in fact, schools were closed for much of the time, uh, but we were interested in what is the effect of seasons. As I'm sure you will know by now, there are three main mechanisms for uh, transmission of COVID-19. You can either have direct contact uh, with the virus um, uh, or you can uh, be exposed directly to droplets, um, uh, which are both of which are essentially sort of close range uh, uh, transmission routes. Uh, we're going to concentrate on uh, the airborne or far field uh, transmission uh, these are small respiratory droplets and aerosols that uh, remain suspended for significant periods of time and are therefore moved around and transported by the ventilation of the building uh, and consequently uh, related to that. Uh, the way that uh, one can do this is to assess the risk of airborne infection using the standard wells riley approach, which says that uh, the probability of infection is uh, given by this formula, one minus the exponential raised to the power. Now, this is uh, then I think fairly straightforward. It's the number of infected people, I, uh, the quanta, which is the amount that they produce uh, at, uh, over time. Uh, the ventilation rate, the pulmonary ventilation rate, the room ventilation rate, and the time of exposure. And one of the difficulties with this, of course, is that uh, one doesn't know many of these things, but one of the things that is hard to estimate is the room ventilation rate. Uh, and we're looking to see whether you can use carbon dioxide as a proxy for that. So uh, these um, uh, number of infections uh, vary uh, with the disease and of course activity levels 
and uh, you have to estimate those. Uh, the other way of looking at this was uh, put together by Rudnick and Milton, who realized that, uh, in fact, uh, what you're really concerned about is the air that's been inside uh, uh, individuals, infected individuals, and then rebreathed by other people, uh, this uh, fraction F. And of course, that's related then to uh, uh, the number of occupants as well, uh, as given by the bottom formula. So what uh, was done was to analyze uh, um, CO2 da data provided by Monodraft um, from a number of schools. You can see we looked at 45 classrooms uh, throughout England, uh, some primary, uh, some secondary, um, and the data span the period from uh, uh, 2015 uh, to 2020, various periods. Um, and uh, you can calculate the rebreathe fraction from CO2 measurements uh, where you measure the CO2C, you take away the uh, ambient CO2, which is the uh, out exterior CO2, and uh, used what the fraction, which is the uh, CO2 and the exhaled breath, which is uh, about uh, 37,000 uh, parts per million. Of course, the ambient CO2 is about 400 parts per million. And you can see in the picture on the and the graph on the left uh, that uh, there's variation from ambient levels just above 400 ppm uh, up to 2,000 uh, in these uh, various classrooms. And we'll go into that in a little more detail in a second. So, as I said, we can now. Um, uh, adapt to this uh, approach of Rudnick and Melton, Milton by looking at the likelihood of an infection when the space is occupied. Uh, so instead of uh, having the, uh, so we now take a, an integral of the rebreathed over the time when the space is occupied, otherwise it's zero. Uh, so again, we take n as the num total number of occupants. Uh, you, typical UCLA classroom has about 32. Uh, this uh, quanta generation rate, again, uh, is, uh, as I said, variable, depends on activity levels. So we've taken the value of one quanta per hour from this paper by Buonanno et al., which has been referred to by many people. Uh, we chose the exposure time to be five weekdays, so uh, for the whole uh, school, and F, the rebreathed fraction, uh, is obtained from the CO2 measurements, as I indicated in the previous slide. And you can calculate the number of secondary infections simply by multiplying this probability of infection by uh, the uninfected um, occupants uh, n minus one. Uh, so here's an example of the CO2 variations in a given classroom. Uh, the pictures on the left cover a week in January, uh, and you see the daily variation and the orange line represents the daily average. Um, so you see that uh, as the classroom is occupied, when uh, students arrive, uh, levels rise. Uh, there are dips during the day associated with breaks and lunchtime, um, and, uh, but high levels are reached, sometimes above 2000 ppm, uh, when you certainly begin to feel drowsy in such an environment. And what you can see, on the right hand picture is the same classroom in July uh, of the same year, 2018. Um, and I think the main thing to carry away from this picture, of course, is that the values are much lower in the summer in July. This is because windows are open uh, much more, there's much more ventilation um, and, uh, and so on. So which is one of the reasons, of course, why winter is such a concern because ventilation rates are low. And as a result, you can calculate the probability of infection uh, for those two weeks uh, for the, those data. Uh, on the left, the, the uh, wintertime probability of infection, um, and on the right, uh, the summertime, which is about, uh, uh, about a third uh, as high as the winter uh, associated with the lower values of, of CO2. And as you can see, it's cumulative. Uh, so when you're in the classroom every day for a week uh, with the same people and the same infected individual, then of course the, the probability of infection increases uh, accordingly. 
should say these numbers are still quite low. Uh, probability of infection is uh, around 2%, so it's uh, not, not a huge probability. Um, the other interesting feature of this is that uh, we looked at classrooms uh, within a given school, with the sa within the same building in the school, and supplied with the same ventilation system. And what's shown here are the average number of secondary infections in each of these classrooms um, uh, for the winter period on the left and the summer period on the right. Um, and uh, I think, well, clearly you see this the same uh, seasonal variation with lower, lower secondary infection numbers in the summer than in the winter. Uh, uh, but I think the other quite surprising feature is the variability between classrooms, which appear uh, to be, to all intents and purposes, identical. And this is something that we want to explore uh, further. Uh, and as I said, uh, you're able to uh, look at um, uh, secondary uh, infections. Uh, uh, these are absolute. Uh, and relative infections over the winter months uh, from uh, November 2015 through to uh, or through the whole year, sorry, school year from November 2015 to March 2020. Um, and again, you can see that uh, the average values are higher, obviously, in the in the winter period, January, February, March, uh, compared to uh, the summer. And even I think uh, before the Half term, October half term values are relatively low, September and the early part of October. So you can find more details about this. This work has been published uh, in Indoor Air uh, and the reference is given uh, uh, here if you want to read more about it. Um, and uh, also to say that we've developed a, uh, a tool called Coast Schools, uh, which is a tool for healthy schools. Um, it uh, involves the code trace project, which I'll say something about in just a minute. Uh, we're using this tool to share our findings as an, with teachers. Uh, it provides guidance uh, for teachers to see whether they're we're, um, uh, following uh, government guidelines. Um, and uh, there's, if you want to have a look at it, there's the web address for it. And of course, um, we'd really welcome any uh, any feedback that you'd like to give us uh, if you're interested in this. So our conclusions of the study is that uh, we think CO2 measurements are useful to estimate airborne inf risk infection. Um, there is wide variety observed between schools, classrooms and across the seasons. Um, uh, we're, there's a drive to improve indoor air quality in schools and beyond, not just from the purposes of disease transmission, but in fact uh, for air pollution generally. Um, and uh, there's still a lot more uh, for us to understand. And as part of that, we have a new project um, called CoTrace. Uh, this is a UKRI funded project uh, which began uh, about uh, a month or six weeks ago. Um, and will last for 18 months. Uh, it's about COVID transmission risk assessment uh, in education. Um, and it involves uh, Henry Burridge and Chris Payne from Imperial College, uh, Prashant Kumar from Surrey University and myself. Uh, the activities we are going to undertake will be to monitor schools, uh, measuring again CO2, but also PM. Uh, because we want to uh, try and relate this uh, not just to uh, ventilation rates, but also air pollution. Uh, we're going to supplement the monitoring uh, with laboratory and uh, CFD studies um, and to, to develop further the mathematical modeling of transmission risk. One of the issues, of course, with the CO2 measurements that uh, I presented earlier is that they are a single measurement in a space. Uh, we know that uh, in many situations, spaces are not well mixed. And so there is a big issue about whether what is a representative uh, CO2 value uh, where people are breathing. Um, and one of the ro roles of the laboratory and CFD work, along with the monitoring, is to try and get some granularity about that and to try and understand better 
how you can relate to sort of global CO2 measurements to more specific uh, building types and so forth. We also plan as part of this project to, to provide advice for schools. As I said, we set up this uh, co-schools um, um, web platform and uh, that will be uh, enhanced by the work that we do uh, through um, through the code trace project and i should also just like to mention that we have uh, another project which is to do with air pollution in schools this is a, a nerc funded project called tapas stands for tackling air pollution at school um, and uh, if you're interested in uh, finding out more about tapas uh, look us up uh, on the web um, uh, we actually have a if i can advertise we have a, a weekly seminar series uh, starting uh, tomorrow at uh, at one o'clock every every Thursday for the next six weeks. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, please uh, e contact me and I can pass on the link for that. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. I'd now like to invite the next speaker. Um, Fred is a graduate of Imperial College a 30 plus years uh, veteran of CFD for industrial applications and managing director of Open CFD Limited, uh, originators and primary release authority of the open source code Open Foam. So welcome, Fred. Please um, share your screen. Thank, thank you, Darren. I've just opened my camera so I can wave at everybody, just say hello. And I'm immediately going to close it down again to give me a better chance on bandwidth. Uh, so here comes the slide presentation. Um, Darren, just shout when you can uh, see it in presentation mode. Should be and coming up now. Check, uh, check their videos and switch them off, uh, please. Thanks. Uh, yep, you're fine. OK, that, that's brilliant. So, so thanks again to the team of organisers for inviting me to give this talk. It's really a CFD perspective on mitigation of the risk of, of, of COVID-19 uh, infection via transmission through, through, through airborne. Um, I've got some examples, but I should really acknowledge right uh, up from the beginning that uh, uh, the, the project and the examples shown are, are part of a UKRI sponsored grant for which we are very grateful. Um, it's being exploited using the open source CFD code called uh, OpenFOAM. And OpenFOAM is released every six months on a fully QA basis by the organization OpenCFD uh, that I'm managing director of. So once again, thanks for the invitation. Uh, from a, a CFD perspective, um, I've gathered as many statements of need as possible, and, and they possibly collate into two main statements here. Um, and they are, uh, how effective is internal ventilation regarding uh, fresh or clean air circulation? Uh, and, and the second question is, what happens to viral load or a contamination source in terms of when it uh, is emitted inside the room, where does it go to? Um, in, in answering those questions, uh, CFD is always about uh, uh, the modeling part, uh, validation of underlying flow physics, and then the combination of those uh, flow physics. To make all these uh, underlying validations uh, of meaning and use, we're, we're trying to introduce metrics which are going to inform not just the engineering society, um, but for uh, casual users of um, uh, facilities providers so that it's interpretable interpretable you know in, in a way that is meaningful for them uh, and, and where their background may not be engineering or science and i'll try to um, uh, illustrate some of the findings so far during this project which started which started in november last year and will go on until uh, around december this year um, uh, using some real case scenarios uh, hopefully um, useful and recognizable to most people so what are we doing with CFD? Uh, we're really solving a set of very complex equations called the Navier-Stokes equations, and we're solving them on computers. Uh, what that does is it uh, solves a system of what's called continuum mechanics equations uh, to, to solve fluid flow, which is recognized as a continuum uh, fluid or a continuum material. Uh, on top of that, uh, as the previous speakers have very clearly mentioned, we're dealing with another form of material in, in, in the form of particulates or aerosols, which are going to interact with the continuum fluid uh, in, in, in which they exist, uh, either by exchanging momentum or mass or, or, or heat. 
And so the combination of the two systems is what's really interesting from the CFP perspective applied to, to, to COVID transmission and mitigation. I mentioned insights and metrics. At the end of the day, uh, what we really want to know is uh, which are the safe places in the room, um, uh, probably uh, directly within a ventilation path and not within a, a, a ventilation uh, kind of a recirculation dead spot. Um, and uh, if, if somehow we identify these uh, these areas, how, how can we measure them and, and present them graphically uh, to, to give uh, lay, lay people, laymen in general, uh, an, an indicator about what's good and what's potentially bad? Um, apart from all that, everyone is going to ask the question, look, this is done on a computer. It's a model. How close is it to reality? So we make really painstaking efforts to make sure that all the underlying physics modeling is, is, is really well validated. So here you see um, the simulation of turbulence and turbulence decay. And the reason I'm showing this is because um, the flow in enclosed environments probably subtends between a laminar, transitional and turbulent flow. So here's one indication of the validation we do across that spectrum. Um, with any form of introduction of heat, uh, the air is going to be potentially buoyant. So we look at buoyancy driven flows um, in a, a laminar situation, but as well as a turbulent situation. And these are nominally validated from well-established and well-recognized uh, experimental databases. Uh, we're also looking at controlled experiments in the sense of rooms with uh, ventilation sources on one side and an extract on the other side where measurements have been taken of what we can then interpret as a fresh uh, air or age of air um, measure. So here's the simulation of open foam um, measured against the, uh, the, the data which is taken in this particular very sim simple room um, of the age of the air at various locations and various vertical lines throughout the room. Um, it's a form of validation. And the validation is saying what form of combination of modeling will give us the best answer uh, correlatable against the experiments or the measurements. And we come up with a, a nominal best practice in the use of a certain type of turbulence model, in this case, KMR SST, for those who are interested. Uh, and it has some really nice uh, features, which are probably uh, above and beyond the, the, the features in other turbulence models, which are uh, particularly applicable to, to, to enclosed environments at low speed. Um, it's not just always about steady state and environments and st steady ventilation sources. We also work with impulsive events. Um, th the most recognizable impulsive event would be uh, talking or shouting, or in this case, coughing on the right hand side of your screen. And we see here a high speed camera um, trying try, try to measure visually uh, the, the penetration and the spread um, of, 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 of a cough coming from a certain patient. Um, now, no cough is the same as the next cough. No single person coughing is the same as the next uh, single person coughing. So essentially, we're looking here at um, general phenomenological behavior to ensure that in the modeling on the bottom, we're seeing something pretty similar to uh, measurements on the top in terms of the, the latitude of the, um, the, the angular uh, penetration and the depth of the penetration of the cough in general. And I think you can see that with these correlations, we're building up a certain amount of confidence that we're modeling what is a reality in a, in a fairly reasonable way. OK, I talked about metrics. Uh, we, we, we've mentioned already age of the air. Um, in terms of indices, if I were to uh, divide the age of the air by the uh, well-known building uh, services regulation uh, measure uh, in terms of room ventilation air changes per hour, I come up with a non-dimensional index, which I'm calling the fresh air index. You could call it a, a freshened air index or cleaned air index, but it's simply dividing something by a well-known quantity, which is used in building design. So this gives me an index, which at value one, will uh, uh, be equivalent to the neutral rating of the design air changes per hour for that particular enclosure. Uh, anything less than one, uh, we can call fresh, and anything greater than one, we can call stale. It's just a measure, and then we can make certain comparatives, uh, one design against the next. OK, I talked about the continuum. Here's some validation of the uh, discrete particulates. So injection of particulates into a, um, a, a continuum fluid um, we are really interested here in certain particulate sizes, as some of the previous uh, speakers have mentioned. 
sub-micron range, unit micron range, and tens of microns uh, uh, size range. And um, the simulation here shows that the penetration depth uh, in terms of that size distribution from the simulation compared with the experiment is, is fairly well correlated. Uh, as to is the penetration, um, the average penetration of the droplets in space. So you can see here that even with the, um, the, the two phase mechanics of uh, particulates uh, in a continuum background, uh, it is seen to uh, be validated or correlated fairly well against experimental data. It's not just about the exhalation part, it's also about the inhalation. So uh, here's a nostril, you're breathing uh, it into your sinus system. And here now is a verification of the deposition in the sinus system on the basis of certain droplet sizes, again, correlating very well with the, the measurements that are available. So finally, let's put all these things together. And here's a nice little cartoon, which is showing a, a spray source, which is against a wind going from the left to the right, uh, then impinging on a surface. And the surface then uh, ga gathers up all the deposits. And uh, depending on what kind of film is being created, uh, that film can also transport depending on the pressurization or the, 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 the gravitational conditions. So putting all these things together in a, in a, in a more realistic scenario, we know that people occupy offices. Um, the offices may have ventilation sources, which may contain ventilation curtains. Uh, one uh, officer may get a visit from someone else who might be a contamination source. And putting all these physics together, it's really nice to be able to see that if the, uh, the visitor is a contaminant and, and, and coughs, where that cough uh, droplet distribution might go in relation to the ventilation sources in the room. This is just a cartoon illustrative of what could be possible when all the combinations of the modeling are put together. I'm now going to show you a few more examples um, of, of, of real life scenarios. So uh, th th these will uh, subtend from the mundane to a little bit more interesting. So let's start with the ridiculous. And this is a washroom, a men's washroom, where we're seeing that there's an extract fan on one end of the room um, sucking in air from the other end of the room. There's a, an, an open doorway here. And what we're looking at on the left hand side is the fresh air index. Anything blue is saying that it's it's uh, it's feeling the fresh air coming from the fresh air source. And anything red uh, suggests that there are recirculations. Uh, and you can see probably from the color index that it's probably quite sensible what we're seeing in relation to the direction of the flow, which I've just, just described to you, coming in from the door on the, the bottom left here and going out the extract of the top right. So from the ridiculous uh, to a, a, a little bit into the sublime, uh, this is uh, from the Archdiocese of Southwark. It's a, uh, it's a church which is essentially um, admitting a footfall of uh, over a thousand people at a weekend, looking at the wind direction westerly or easterly coming in through open doors and open ventilators, the windows. Um, this is a winter scenario where the cold air is then dumping, spilling onto the uh, onto the main uh, nave here, where uh, most people will be uh, will, will be sitting, and spreading quite efficiently uh, in in terms of circulating the fresh air that comes in from the windows and the doors, both for an easterly and a westerly wind condition. Let me show you next what the fresh air index is showing as, as indicated from those contours. A lot of the fresh air dumps onto the ground level here. Um, I run a choir. Uh, the choir is sitting up in the choir loft over here. And unfortunately, the choir loft is probably one of the most dangerous uh, places in terms of the, uh, the, the, the stale air contents or, 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 or recirculation in this particular volume. Um, I know that if I introduce any palliatives, any devices to freshen the air, that's probably one of the first places that I'll intend to put it. I've just got two more examples. One is a, a generic example of a, an operating theater where displacement ventilation uh, over a large surface area comes in at a fairly high air changes per, per, per hour, it being a medical grade uh, ventilation and going out of uh, some, some ventilation on, on, on the sides of the room. Uh, so here you'll see the fresh air index, essentially where the patient and the operators are, uh, are, are occupying. Um, they're seeing the direct ventilation coming from the displacement ventilation source at the top of the room. However, in the corners of the room, uh, if, if effectively we're seeing that it's quite stale. So if we were to place a device, uh, a cleansing device, uh, it's this kind of color index, which is telling us where might be a very effective place to put it. So let's introduce a uh, industrial grade um, uh, UV scrubber or cleanser. Uh, let's introduce it at that corner of the room and see what it does. And this is what CFD will tell us in terms of how the air could be freshened 
and how it then compares with the previous situation without an air scrubber. Um, just a couple more examples here. We, we, we've been working with, uh, with, with the NHS, um, the Department of Health and Social Care, um, and, and their deployment from the, the military. Uh, that's the, 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 the UK Army. Uh, the UK Army Engineering Corps has has, has been tasked with designing uh, uh, both of these systems, which are mobile processing units, um, a van pro processing unit and, and, and a trailer processing unit, where all the samples that uh, you see in the mobile testing uh, locations, the samples go to these vans or these, uh, the, these trailers uh, and are tested very rapidly to give that very fast turnaround. And of course, these being mobile and agile, uh, can be deployed anywhere around the country, and you've probably seen many of those uh, around where you live. So the very nice uh, kind of statement of value that we've seen from Major Ross Carter, uh, who's, who's the engineering lead from the military, is that he's saying that uh, CFD has certainly allowed them to de-risk a number of significant areas of concern, and they're able then to report to the chief scientific officer at the NHS with some level of confidence uh, verifiable through this different scenarios that have been tested using the CFD. My final example is, uh, is from a team of uh, uh, NHS uh, clinical engineering leads. Uh, it is cross UK. Um, it's led by Professor Tony Fisher, who's at the Royal Liverpool Hospital and uh, deploying a team across the NHS uh, from the Midlands, that's Claire and Peter, uh, from, uh, from, from uh, around the Cambridge area, including Addenbrooke's, that's, that's Paul, and in the Wales Health Board area, that's, that, that, that's Chris. Essentially, what we're looking here is at um, AGPs, aerosol generation procedures, um, the requirements on fallow time, and how useful air scrubbers could be within these enclosed environments. So let me just say that again, AGPs would be for dentistry, somebody coming in to your mouth with a drill and creating lots of, uh, lots of spray. The fallow time is an indication here of how long you need to leave the room unoccupied to allow all the droplets somehow to disperse or to settle to make the room safe again. And the use of air scrubbers is potentially how we can reduce the fallow time from, from the current advice to something lower on the basis of real scientific evidence. So here now is the Children's Birmingham Hospital uh, dental treatment room, um, where we are locating the dentist sitting on the chair here, the patient lying on, 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 the, on the table or the, or the inclined chair, and someone standing in the background that might be the dental nurse. Uh, the room is supplied by a building uh, air supply with an exhaust on the other side of the room. And um, the, the designs of these vents can be arbitrary or, 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 or well thought through. I, I, I don't mean anything negative in the sense of arbitrary or, or, or well, well, well thought through. It's just that what has been fitted at the time it was built is what's there. How can we understand that? How can we improve that? So we're looking at different scenarios. The different scenarios are um, measured by the age of the air. And we notice here that uh, uh, without any air scrubbers, just the building ventilation, uh, probably the average age of the air is, is 10 minutes. If we were to open windows or use a different type of diffuser, we might gain 10% in, in terms of the average age of the air. As soon as you introduce a scrubber with a certain rating, at a low rating, we can halve the potential fallow time. And when it's on a purge rating, uh, we could probably uh, reduce to one third the, uh, the fallow time previously experienced without any event ventilation mechanisms. So here on the left-hand side, you'll see just the room ventilation. And on the right-hand side, you'll see with one of these air scrubber devices placed, not quite arbitrarily, but because of a good penetration and good mixing, it probably doesn't matter a huge deal where the, uh, where, where the scrubbers are placed. And you can see from this synchronized time animation of the spread of the fresh air, um, how the, the, the scrubber device is circulating and freshening the air really quite more efficiently than just the room ventilation alone. The, the next picture is a combination of the fresh air index, as well as uh, looking at a potential viral load coming from the vicinity of the patient's mouth. So without the air scrubber, we're seeing that the uh, air ventilation paths uh, going north, south, east, west from the roof 
essentially creates a recirculation that gathers up all the um, uh, the, the output from uh, f from the patient's mouth and, and then it drags it upwards and then efficiently spreads across the room again. With the scrubber, that path can change. It can change um, accidentally or by design, uh, fortuitously or not. And in this case, we see that the prevailing airflow conditions with the scrubber in place is unfortunately actually blowing directly at, at, at the dentist. So now we just see the, the kind of studies and the kind of understanding that you can get on the basis of existing ventilation designs um, or modifications using palliatives such as scrubbers. Um, I'm just taking a slice through the, the, the room ventilation here, uh, going through the vicinity of the, the patient and, and the dentist. Um, the diffuser is blowing north, south, east, west, and it kind of hugs the, the, the roof and then circulates um, uh, towards the center of the room. Um, it's kind of blue and then going to red, so very fresh and a little bit staler here. As soon as you then introduce the scrubber, we see that the churning and cleaning effect is uh, ensuring that you're getting a cleaned air circulation in the room in a much more efficient way. So I hope that was kind of useful in terms of real practical um, CFD value here. Uh, we will very, very much appreciate the measurements that are going to be taken by the, the Airboards team and look to be interacting with that team very, very closely in the remaining months of this project. So just some closing remarks as follows. Um, we're trying here to make CFD accessible for facilities providers. These are essentially non-CFD experts uh, with the confidence that CFD has been around for you know, five decades or probably more and is very, very highly validated across uh, a number of individual physics and combined physics. Um, we're all told, and, and I believe it absolutely, that ventilation is extremely important. So on the basis of that, we're able now to learn how to measure how to optimize and to mitigate um, the, the ventilation scenarios in a way that just makes us all feel uh, with better well-being, uh, are able to be more healthy and, and safer in terms of outlook. Um, this project uh, will output a cloud-based application. Um, open Foam is, is open source, so in, in, in principle, anybody listening and anybody out there will be able to use this tool um, on, on, on the basis of cloud application. Uh, we're calling it uh, uh, VentEasy easy ventilation. Um, I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, it is kind of in alpha beta mode at the moment, uh, so available for any of you to test if you'd like to do that, just please get in touch with me. Very grateful again, just to repeat that, to Innovate UK and UKRI for granting us this award. Um, we're we're uh, exploring several stakeholder uh, examples. Uh, you've seen some of them uh, here this afternoon. And we're still open to, to including more stakeholder studies. So if you'd like to become involved in that, just let me know. So with that, Darren, I'll pass back on to you. Thanks very much. Fred, um, we're running a bit behind. Uh, I would like to invite the next speaker, or I should say uh, two heads are better than one, a double uh, set, double header. Uh, Farang is a lecturer in engineering and architectural design at UCL, Institute for Environmental Design and engineering, and Elizabeth is a doctoral researcher at UCL Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering, working on indoor air quality. I'll hand it to you. Hi, um, thanks, Darren, and um, uh, thanks everyone for giving Farhang and I the chance to um, share some of the work that uh, we've been doing the past um, almost year um, now. Uh, I am going to try to share um, the right screen with you um, and I'm hoping that that is a full screen look. Yep. Yep. Okay. I'll turn off my, my camera. So, um, so the, the, uh, work that we are presenting um, is indoor air quality uh, during lockdown, uh, monitoring based simulation assisted study in London. It's actually uh, work that piggybacked on a, a larger monitoring study uh, funded by EIT Digital called Quasimodo uh, that measured indoor air quality and portable air purifier use uh, for nearly a year uh, in um, 2019 in, into 2020, we measured um, uh, almost 60 dwellings in uh, Eindhoven, Helsinki, and in London. Uh, 
The aims of the work I'm going to present here um, were to analyze occupant behavior and measured indoor air quality before and during the lockdown that was mandated in um, England and Wales to help control the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the, the analysis was done in an effort to understand the implications of the lockdown on the development of occupant window operation models and to uh, hopefully in the future explore potential alternative strategy uh, ventilation strategies to improve or mitigate any degradation of indoor air quality. Um, a little bit uh, more background. Um, so as we all saw that throughout um, the world, um, governments uh, instituted a variety of measures to try to curb the spread of COVID-19 and improve public health. In the UK, that took the shape of a nationwide lockdown uh, as of the 23rd of March 2020. Uh, the mandate, uh, as it was, continued until the 13th of June. And um, again, as you all are well aware, we've kind of gone in and out of different states of lockdown over the uh, past, it's been 14, 15 months. Uh, we had the unique advantage of the existing Quasimodo um, IAQ and window operation monitoring campaign uh, taking place. So when we got the lockdown order, uh, we still had monitoring equipment uh, installed in London um, in eight flats that allowed us to continue to, to monitor. Uh, the flats were located at two sites in three buildings uh, were located with um, that were excuse me were both built uh, within the last decade. Um, all the flats use operable windows as the primary means of ventilation. Most have extractor fans and some utilize mechanical ventilation with heat recovery in the heating season. Um, data were collected on a wide range of parameters indoors and out, including temperature, relative humidity, carbon dioxide, uh, and um, PM10 and PM2.5. Uh, also window operations uh, and occupancy were monitored. The first notable but probably not surprising result from the monitoring was that occupancy increased overall um, with especially large increases in occupancy during weekday typical working hours. Uh, in the figures shown here, uh, the solid lines uh, represent occupancy pre-pandemic and the dashed lines are during the lockdown. So pretty clear um, difference uh, between the two periods of time. Uh, perhaps more surprising was the change in how windows were operated during the period of increased occupancy. In an effort to avoid uh, any differences in behavior due to weather uh, differences, we compared data from pre-lockdown in August through October 2019 uh, into the lockdown period starting in mid-March of 2020. What we saw was that windows in the living rooms were open for less time during the lockdown than pre-lockdown, despite the increase in occupied hours. Uh, turns out the median open state uh, duration of living room windows during lockdown was nearly half of what it was before lockdown. Uh, additionally, windows were operated less frequently uh, during the day um, during lockdown. Uh, given the increased occupancy rates and the decreased window open state, it's not surprising, therefore, that in these naturally, uh, mostly naturally ventilated flats, the CO2 concentrations were markedly higher during the lockdown period. Again, uh, the dashed uh, red is lockdown, the, the uh, solid blue is pre-lockdown. Uh, also uh, looked at PM 2.5 and PM 10. Um, and uh, when we examined uh, the indoor air quality for those, we observed changing trends uh, in concentration of both. Although outdoor concentrations were slightly lower during the lockdown, indoor concentrations rose. Notably in the typical pre-lockdown trend, there's a small peak in the morning that's reflective of uh, traffic related generation. Um, and then it uh, drops uh, in concentration throughout the day before a uh, peak in the evening, um, probably associated with a meal preparation. Um, so during the lockdown, there was no daytime drop in concentration and the magnitude of the largest peak in the evening was much greater, uh, which you can see in the figure. 
Uh, we observed uh, similar trends for both PM10 and, and PM2.5. Uh, this um, this one uh, figure here is for PM10, but uh, a similar similar looking one for PM2.5. I will stop sharing. So Farhang, uh, if he is ready to. Um, I believe you see the next slide from me and uh, I take over from Elizabeth to just give you a quick report on a simulation study that we did here. So we took one of the flats and uh, made a building energy model out of it. And this model had also the airflow network uh, module enabled, which is a simple bulk airflow that can give a rough estimation of uh, uh, air change rate. And uh, what made it much made this study a bit different from typical energy modeling efforts was that we had the data on occupancy and window operation. So we fed that data into the model so that we can better calibrate it uh, for the purpose of indoor air quality assessments. And uh, following that, so with less unknown parameters, we subjected the parameters that control the uh, air change assessment to a calibration process. For example, how much ventilation we get when windows are closed, what is the air mass flow coefficient at that time, or what is the uh, open factor for different windows in the room, or in terms of CO2 generation, what are assumptions about the generation rates or the activity levels of the occupants. So doing that, so and also with the help of some uh, active visualizations, so we could try, we tried to uh, calibrate the initial model such that we have a better representation of the buildup of the CO2 in the room and also the decay when the occupants are not there. Here you see the snapshot of four days, but also we could see it in terms of a specific error metrics that we could reduce that with the calibrated model. So having such a model, then we managed to test a number of ventilation strategies to mainly quantify the impact, the positive impact that they can have for us in terms of indoor air quality. So we tested different ventilation strategies, but we also had a sort of worst case scenario as a benchmark in which uh, the windows stayed closed. So uh, worst case scenarios in uh, non-heating season we tested it with normal and occupancy during lockdown. And you see, for example, in the living room with normal occupancy, we had maximum CO2 of around 4,000 ppm, whereas with lockdown occupancy, it was around 5,000. Or more importantly, as we in this period also work from home, so you can see that during active time before the lockdown, we had like just only 20% of active time above it threshold of, for example, 2,500 ppm, whereas during the lockdown it was about 65 if the windows are not opened in this uh, worst case scenario. But of course, then we uh, tested different ventilation strategies. For example, one of them, test number three here, you see that we assume that we have a pattern of window opening as suggested here in this solid yellow line, and this resulted in a, a much better situation. You can see uh, in the living, uh, uh, 0% above 2,500 ppm active time. It is a non-heating season, so we could ventilate the room quite effectively very easily. Uh, but in heating season, of course, this situation is more challenging, so we introduced more uh, stringent ventilation possibilities with shorter periods of time, but we tried, for example, in this test number six, we divided, through, divided it throughout the day so that we can fight against the buildup of CO2 concentration as our proxy. So you see that even in winter with natural ventilation, we still managed to, for example, bring that active time about 2,500 ppm to zero and noticeably decrease the peak CO2 that we had, arguably without that much cost in terms of heating demand for the two months that we simulated. But of course, as uh, Elizabeth suggested, these buildings had also, some of them had mechanical ventilation with heat recovery also to, in general, to see that potential. Of course, if we have such a possibility in a building, 
we can do much better, for example, with a mechanical with, uh, with a seven liter per second uh, and uh, specific uh, effectiveness of, for example, 75%, whereas you get the much better air quality with CO2 concentrations that do not exceed uh, 1,300 or so, the heating demand increase that you should pay for is much less. So these were a number of tests that we did uh, with energy modeling, and I conclude by uh, reiterating some of the key findings here. So we observed that we had we have had higher concentrations of CO2 and PM10 and PM2.5 in the buildings during the lockdown, and the PM values were not uh, directly correlated to the outdoor situation. So it was mainly due to the increased uh, occupancy and the associated activities. Uh, also, we observed that somewhat surprisingly that despite higher occupancy hours, occupants did not open the windows more, but even less. And uh, one thing that I didn't present here is that we also tried to uh, infer the drivers behind window opening in the follow-up study. And there we observed that actually uh, what explained the window operation behavior was mainly indoor temperature and not indoor air quality. So that can to some extent explain this situation and the fact that maybe we really need to give uh, raise awareness in this regard because we are not that much sensitive in terms of indoor air quality to trigger ventilation. And finally, just the test, the simulation test, building energy simulation test uh, showed us that even in a flat with one-sided ventilation, which we might have in many small flats, uh, with a simple ventilation strategy or with uh, uh, mechanical ventilation, we can really maintain acceptable uh, levels of CO2 concentration. And that concludes my presentation. This was funded by EPSRC and SIPSI Research Fund. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Frank and Elizabeth. I'm now going to share my screen. Oh, on, bear with me. Small window. Can you see my screen yet? Not yet. Still loading. It's black screen, Darren. We could be four, but then I think we're inside. Okay, bear with me. I'll try again. Are we there now? Yeah, we can see it now. OK, that's the PDF. Just make sure of the PowerPoint. Apologies for that. OK, hopefully we're there. Looks good. Sorry. Right. Are we there now? Great, apologies for that. Yes. Um, so I'm going to, um, as I said, I was going to uh, talk about where we currently are and where we could go, uh, give my take on things. And I'll do this at breakneck speed, and I think we're going to uh, extend our time a little bit so we can answer some of those questions. So I've set myself some key questions. Uh, what are the key airborne infection simulation and analysis tools, characteristics and considerations? What new tools and applications are on the horizon and what could moving forward with them look like? So tools, characteristics and considerations. I want to start some spatial, temporal and building science disparities. So first of all, on the experimental and field work. Um, obviously, this is uh, complementary and it provides a validation route um, how we can look at the uh, various correlations between this and our tools and make sense of the uh, physical and numerical 
um, outputs. And um, there may be some limited measurements uh, because a single point by zone. Uh, sometimes there's a uh, high frequency sampling, but not necessarily the case if you need to identify what the uh, particular bacteria or virus is. There's uh, sampling resilience from capture to testing as a question. And then there's uh, proxies uh, versus uh, perhaps uh, limited biology and epidemiology at micro scale, the difficulty in capturing things at micro, micro scale. On the analytical and um, sometimes we call simple tools, but perhaps we should look at that again, uh, looking at some of the presentations earlier. Uh, they again may be single, single point or mixed zone outputs, uh, steady state or transient defined by the calculation type, um, and maybe simple physics, but we've seen some complex physics earlier. Then there's dynamic thermal modeling. These are uh, can be multi mixed zone, uh, often um, coarse zones. They're typically one hour time steps. Uh, one key software uh, may limit that to six minutes if you wish to. There are detailed systems, models and controls uh, possible. And there's a good capture of surface temperatures may be important for the buoyancy driven flows. And then there's CFD, which we've uh, seen today as well, um, where you've got detailed air movement, advanced aerosol turbulence mixing, transport capture, yeah. Uh, mainly steady state, but um, could be um, where you calculate for minutes, uh, possibly not practical for hours. And there's some detailed source or receptor models that you can include. And with all the tools at the moment, there may be limited biology and epidemiology, but it's still useful for the um, design development. So this was uh, something I presented back in 2012 at a SIBZ event. Um, it's a very, very old graph where we're, we're looking at concentration versus ventilation and finding that balance between environmental quality and environmental efficiency. So as you increase your ventilation rate, concentrations go down and then there'll be a specific um, energy demand for that ventilation rate if you pick a target um, for, for example, for your indoor air quality, then that would give you this um, optimum point um, uh, where to operate. How would we look that differently if it was environmental quality and safety as well? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. There's a treatment of sources and receptors. That's more sort of CFD language, uh, exhaling and inhaling. Um, and this was from a PhD, um, um, Abigail, we heard about her earlier as part of the air bods. Uh, just one paragraph on there, simple multi-zone models are compared to CFD and found to perform well at simulating bioaerosol decay within large spaces that can be assumed to be well mixed. However, they're not refined enough to simulate the detail required to study the transfer of infection between individual patients. So there's many, many questions. I'm just raising a few here. On the source side, is a different approach needed for masks and the impact of air movement over the body? I read this paper about how that impacts your, your source. On the receptor side, what can we learn from previous inhaler effectiveness research to guide our ventilation risk models? Uh, we know that the smaller droplets go deeper into your respiratory tract. Is there something that we can bring there into our thinking? We need to define acceptable tolerances. There's a lot of unknowns. Can we simplify that into low, medium and high to support the design process um, and modify our simplified calculations later? Um, sensitivity testing is important in modelling um, and how that might impact ventilation strategies. Can we, is it possible to define an acceptable tolerance in real world scenarios outside test chambers with all the various disparities? I'm hoping in air bods we might be able to answer that one. Does it, this really matter when the objective is to specify practical viable design solutions with sufficient operational flexibility? Then there's a the design of scenarios. How can we batch sources? For example, does a highly infectious scenario with a mask equate to a less infectious one without one? How can we tabulate these scenarios for different tools and models and uh, deal with the different formats? How do we deal with receptors, uh, for example, mannequins versus mix zone or breathing zone? 
for a child in a pushchair, for example. Occupancy density. How do we deal with that with single or multiple activities? What boundaries do we need for performance led design and what standardization might be applicable? So new tools and methods. This is a dynamic thermal model because the design builder looking at standard CO2 control with that set limit. The sorts of outputs that you might get, um, higher change rate resulting from the standard approach, your high particulates and you get a uh, particular um, energy usage. If you revise your control strategy and you close the vents if the outdoor particulates were uh, above a particular threshold, what might that look like? So we're getting a, a different uh, correlation there, um, looking at how um, you may have a, a, your outdoor above your indoor particulates and reduced energy usage. So 28% less than uh, the relaxation, sorry, 20% less due to the relaxation of those limits. So what would an airborne infection control strategy look like? The use of uh, indoor air quality proxies um, we need to think about, and also all the various systems that we're putting in there. Uh, can we use these types of studies to understand their value um, together with things like um, uh, using mechanical and natural ventilation. So CFD with biophysics, this is a model where we've got uh, evaporation, Lagrangian particle tracking, aerosol droplet nuclei, uh, part two phase flow. The evaporation is dependent on moisture content and temperatures. We have sticky or non-sticky surfaces for particle deposition. We've got a grid of sources one and a half meters above floor level applied to the fixed vector field. We've got near field dro larger droplets and aerosol continuum size change and transport. So we're quite interested in the horizontal horizontally and vertically how the air is moving from this um, breathing zone one and a half meters above the ground. We've got a whole range of different um, user functions that we can put into the CFD droplet decay and um, looking at the effect of um, air speed as well. So once they're plugged into the CFD. You can get these sorts of plots out. Um, this is looking at pollutant removal effectiveness. It's a basic derived output. And you would think from here, if you've got a high pollutant removal effectiveness in the breathing zone, it's actually quite good. Um, if you actually look to um, derive additional um, information, this is um, looking at the contamination, or you could call it a, a social distancing plot. And we're actually seeing that um, that's not necessarily in the areas where horizontal air movement dominate. So there's been a lot of talk about um, zones. Um, but also it's not just about um, air movement from one point to another, um, how cross flow um, uh, uh, impacts the risk and how potentially you might be able to move air vertically so that um, you may de-risk due to the paths that the air takes. So moving forward, uh, I thought I'd dream up some new project scopes, over occupancy risk assessment. Um, it's a reasonably straightforward um, converting a thermal compliance model, which we have um, on many projects, into a performance model with indoor air quality proxies. And we should be able to test for allowable upper occupancy density in different space types. That's one idea. Uh, breathing zone and ventilation efficiency tests. So um, beyond you know, using air changes for fresh air, minimum fresh air guidance, looking at the breathing zone in more detail. Then there's the defining of airborne infection ventilation control modes. A couple of questions there. For a hybrid system operating in cool natural ventilation mode, at what point does the space become too cold and too poorly ventilated for safe, safe airborne infection limits? And then what combination of environmental with biophysics measures are appropriate to drive that um, mechanical switch? A couple more ideas. It was good to see Fred's uh, talk earlier with the corners. Uh, so I put in um, room corner safety checks as an idea. Uh, we know that cooler than ambient surface air draws polluted air downwards. What's the risk to corner breathing zone where air movement is reduced? And then finally, um, designing for secure ventilation. We know that um, 
window openings in the flow that we get through are restricted by blinds and curtains and people close them due to security fears. How do we design more secure ventilation systems, improve purge ventilation and use nat natural tempering as well away from the building um, perimeter? So this is um, more air bricks, uh, an example of more air bricks plus hit and miss floor vents air connected to your chimneys. Um, uh, as a potential idea, uh, again, challenging to simulate. So understanding airborne infection dynamics, coach loads of people over short periods, people moving and turning, their impact on emission sources, turbulent mix up, uh, turbulent mixing, build up and decay in different design scenarios, and defining this control mode, doors, opening, closing, revolving, lifts, and reanimation of particles off surfaces due to various activities. So is it time of change thinking? We know um, Florence knew what, um, knew what to do. We've had the tragic case of Ella, who was uh, killed by air pollution, and the tragic case of 40,000 people being killed prematurely in the UK by air pollution. The evidence that um, long-term exposure um, is uh, a key link to um, COVID deaths. Uh, in recent years, uh, the evidence of uh, stunted child lung growth. Um, so what are we storing up for the future in terms of our airborne infection resilience? We've had the, um, the tragedy of Grenfell, um, the focus on building safety and compliance, the need to look at these disasters, an initial focus on facade um, and facade safety, it, probably moving towards overheating risk and then um, pollution risk, that would be good. Uh, There's some excellent programmes out there, clean air programme, the funding's going in, breathing cities, uh, which I've signed up to and you can all um, sign up to these. Um, and breathing cities looks at holistic coupled indoor air, outdoor air flows. I found this um, document um, from several years ago, pre-pandemic, talking about prevention is better than cure. And it says uh, scientific advances that could see life threatening viral outbreaks stopped before they start. I don't think that was um, aimed or uh, necessarily at ventilation, but I'll take that. Then there's climate change. So um, we know um, uh, hitting net zero early isn't job done. Uh, we need to adapt. Um, we need to start now. And uh, there's a question about, uh, I think, about how increased airborne infection resilience might be um, increased uh, through uh, the way that we respond to our climate challenge, the climate emergency. So I've drawn up a few circles uh, of resilience and virtuosity. This is what a positive one might look like. Cooler and cleaner cities through urban blue greening. Um, there's a talk at the bottom there, which I talked about that last year would lead to more naturally ventilated buildings, exercising locally, healthy population, increased productivity asset value, and increased airborne infection and climate change resilience. What does a positive, uh, a potential negative one look like? Hotter, dirtier cities, more mechanically ventilated buildings, filters, energy usage, exhausted heat, unhealthy population, reduced productivity and asset value, and reduced airborne infection and climate change resilience. So I'm sure you could all draw your own circles and they might look a bit different, but I think um, whatever you, we, you should all agree with me that we need to get a lot better at joining the dots. So last two slides, key considerations and challenges moving forward. Uh, the better use of simulation and analysis. Uh, it's about understanding those uncertainties, tolerances and disparities, um, those design of scenarios, getting those um, um, def better defined, integrating the thinking into digital twins with better control strategies. Uh, digital twins are going to explode over the coming years. Um, replacing assumptions with better um, uh, and, and simplified methods with better evidence uh, further down the line. So developing this biophysics models within the uh, built environment context. Um, indirectly, Improving airborne resilience uh, with better linked building simulation and analysis tools, uh, supporting that um, positive circle of resilience and virtuosity, and improved understanding of breathing zones, efficient delivery of diluting air 
for uh, better airborne infection uh, resilience and operational control modes. Finally, uh, better design practices and improved policies. So um, we need to design intelligent spaces for optimum energy and ventilation balance, um, a lot better than we're doing at the moment. Uh, we need to develop un this understanding between the overlap of the proxies and airborne infection control, control strategies supporting uh, health and productivity. We need to incorporate the lessons learned from hospital-acquired infections. Uh, the current airborne infection research, we heard a lot about that today. There's a lot more going on. And we need to um, look at the export, expert bio aerosol scientist metrics and practices. We've seen some of them today, such as Quanta, Wells Riley, and dose responses as well, and see how we bring that into mainstream building design practices. Generally, we need to look at disease and ventilation control with new eyes. We need to break the silos through multidisciplinary holistic design processes that involves better procurement of studies and services and better regulations and policies as well. Um, so how about the new Clean Air Act or Environmental Protection Act to incor incorporate airborne infection? I'm not going to hold my breath on that, but what I would say is that um, any way we can um, encourage the use of um, uh, the uh, use of performance-led design, um, have building simulation at its centre, and the um, uh, science as its foundation. That must be encouraged. We need to promote safer environments. How many people have contracted uh, COVID and either died or are living li with long COVID due to poor ventilation? We need to upskill, better guidance, uh, training. Um, that's well within our grasp. And then um, off the back of the research that we're doing at the moment. And then we need to be better communicators, learn the lessons from the past SARS um, in 2003, hospital acquired infection, C. diff, all those things, but also the lessons we're learning now and help communicate that better. So that's my summary. Can we now ask all the speakers, it was breakneck speed, sorry about that, um, and we've overrun, so again, doubly sorry about that. Um, can we ask all the speakers to unvideo themselves and unmute themselves? And anyone who's not a speaker, can you please um, switch your video off? There's still several people not speakers who have their video on. Manuel, can you please switch your video off? Apologies again, we have overrun, but it's an important topic. Um, Malcolm has uh, sent his apologies, so sorry that we can't ask him any questions. So a general question just to get things going, and there were several questions answered by Malcolm in the chat box, so um, hopefully um, that he's dealt with them. So first one for Paul. Are you there, Paul? I think that Paul also, I think I read that he had to, previous engagements that he had to get okay. to. Right, so first question to Fred. Uh, what's the computer platform you're using for your models in terms of performance parameters, flops or other measure? Uh, it, it's pretty standard based on HPC um, that, that you see out there. So any cloud provider or any HPC provider, no, normally it'll be uh, uh, machines that are rated at about uh, 2.8 or 3 uh, uh, gigs. Um, usually the nodes will come uh, with 32 or 64 processors. So what we're seeing, for example, the, the office scenario uh, turns around in, in uh, about 20 minutes, 30 minutes on just one of those nodes in steady state. So it, it's, it's, it, it's a fairly quick turnaround. The transient will probably take an order, order of magnitude more than that. 
Um, yeah, I, I hope that answered the question. I, I kind of posted a, a very brief answer along those lines in the chat post as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, during the AGPs, we would ideally reduce the air circulation due to increased possibilities for the aerosols to be transferred to the dentist. Is there, so we don't have, uh, is Ben here at all as well? No. OK, there's one more question. Um, so it's early days, but what thoughts do the speakers think will be a long term impact on building design as a result of work such as this? Do we expect it to end with simply an increase in mandatory minimum fresh air change rates uh, with the rest as good best design practice optional? Or could it effectively outlaw large open plan offices? I think some right. of us hope that the open plan offices go away, but um, I, I do think there is a, there is some movement in that direction, um, more compartmentalization of spaces, um, more personal um, ventilation options. Um, more personal comfort options just more generally in terms of heating and cooling. Um, I think um, given that the current standards for ventilation are, um, aren't really based on good uh, evidence of, of health benefit, they're uh, more about uh, comfort and um, odor. I think that reevaluating those going forward will happen. I think we'll see changes to that. Um, and I think there, there are some places in the world that are a little bit farther behind than others, but um, moving towards uh, more uh, dedicated outdoor air systems, um, more um, specific um, uh, decoupling of uh, the thermal uh, comfort and air uh, needs. I think I think all of those will happen. That's, that's my my opinion. Any, any other? Uh, responses to that or shall I move to the next one? Okay, I'll move to the next one. Um, how do we address the potential increased energy consumption and carbon emissions from increased ventilation against the health benefits? I Brian? can quickly just uh, uh, reiterate that, of course, with uh, the ventilation heat recovery systems, I believe uh, we wouldn't put so much cost uh, in terms of energy demand. And also our tests show that if you do ventilation for short amounts of time, you do manage to get some fresh air without, again, that much of uh, cost in terms of energy demand. So that's my view, I think. The cost is not that much in terms of energy demand. Yeah, uh, Darren, a lot of the existing building uh, spaces um, you know, probably don't have the flexibility to, uh, to, to to even start to or consider opening windows or, or, or any kind of ventilation. So I think we're left with a situation where uh, current technology development uh, in the form of air scrubbers, I'm not trying to sell air scrubbers here at all, but it, is, it does give us a, 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 another dimension beyond what we're kind of uh, has been imposed on us um, by inability to open windows or, or, or whatever, or building management ventilation systems. Um, so the technology is becoming fairly well proved and, and, and introduces a kind of agility that I think would be silly at this point to count. So well worth considering. Okay, thank you. I'll just ask a couple more. I'm, I'm, um, perhaps we have one or two minutes more, then we'll bring it to an end because we're 15 minutes over. And I think this one is actually um, towards Fred. Um, are we happy that the current simulation tools can do the job? Uh, Navier Stokes equations are 150 years old and they do not have the complete solutions, and CFD has been around for 50 years. Isn't it time for interactive CFD development? I, I sort of saw that question, didn't know how to begin to answer that because I'm not quite sure what the questioner is, uh, uh, is asking in relation to interactive uh, CFD. I think it's really the definition of interactive CFD. Uh, CFD has value uh, for sure, 
the validation of the CFD for particular scenarios is going to give everybody the confidence that it's well applied to the scenario to which it, it, it's being pointed. I think we need to kind of just uh, square up those two points uh, to make sure that they're well validated. Um, and, and then I think we have huge confidence that uh, for ventilation scenarios, CFD is doing a very good job. Okay, uh, unless uh, is anyone seeing in the panel any more questions that you are burning that you think we should tackle? Oh, here's one, uh, last one. Let's make this the last question. Um, Will there be options developed for retrofitting existing buildings? I can see that's a challenging question. Uh, yeah, Darren, you should answer this maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the, the physics are there, whether it's um, retrofitting or, or, or new build. Um, so I, I think when we when we get a much better handle of the biofix, biophysics um, and, and how we can use our tools to explore options, it's all about the optioneering, and um, then the, the solutions will not only be for new build and design. Um, AirBods is about the, the BOD bit is building operation and design. So how we operate um, buildings again if something that um, we need to be able to get a much better idea uh, about building in uh, additional airborne infection resilience into that thinking. So um, that's my view. Uh, anyone else at all? Well answered, Darren. <laughs> I'm not on the fence there. Um, OK, so um, thank you, everyone. Um, we, we had um, maybe 160 people um, at the beginning, ending on 80 people. So um, I think it's been a very, very good uh, session. Sorry again for running over 15 minutes. I uh, didn't want to stop anyone short. And I'm glad we've had um, a bit of a talk uh, afterwards as well. So um, thank you, everyone. And this will be up on the Building Simulation Group past presentations area and possibly linked to on the IBIPSA England.